Hello and welcome to the Late Lunch Leftovers podcast. This is where we take a look back at some of our highlights from the past week. And once again, we were able to join Georgie Revel at the Cook Shack in Bride and learned how to make a wonderful pumpkin pie, very seasonal. We also met the Manx Chef of the Year and he passed on some of his hints and tips to us as well. We solved the Marjaduni Challenge, which was set for us by Phil Gorn and Simon Clark with a trip to Ramsey. And we were joined once again in the studio by Carol Ellis, the baking bard. I have to ask you, I know I always make the Jane McDonald reference. I'm so sorry, but she likes cruising. She belts out a few numbers on a cruise ship. Have you ever been asked to? I don't belt out any numbers on a cruise ship, but uh, I often get, uh, when I'm in the dinner queue, you know, queuing up, and people will say, oh, I thought it was Jane McDonald when they hear me talking. You see, they might hear me behind me, and I go, no, no, it's not her. It's not, I wish I could sing like her. <laughs> But she could get up and do poems for everyone. Oh, That's what you could do, Carol, isn't it? But also, in between the time since we last saw you, you've had two big events. Uh, so, uh, one is that the big wedding. Oh, the big wedding, the wedding of the year. Yes. Yes, it was fantastic. Who got married? My daughter, Jessica, got married to uh, David uh, in July 27th in Ballina Hinch in a fabulous uh, location. And we actually had... Such good weather that we had the ceremony outside. And did you bake the cake? No, because I couldn't transport it because we had to go across in a in the Mustang. Michael's got oh, a Mustang. Oh, the Mustang's beautiful. Well, Jessica wanted to get to go to the church, uh, not the church, to go to the venue in the Mustang. How cool is that? Totally rock and roll. Well, it was cool, but it was a little bit of a worry for me because I didn't think she'd get the dress in the Mustang, <gasps> but she did. Oh, and a bit of a squeeze. There. And we couldn't have fit the cake in, so we did no. get the cake in. But did you do a poem for her? Oh, yes, I did a poem, yes. Ah, I yes. bet that was a weepy. No, it wasn't a weepy. It was a, a funny. So it was more, I did a few jokes and then I told her, uh, then I read the poem. So it went down very well. Oh, how lovely. I know. Um, you are going to do a poem for us this afternoon. Yes. And I believe that this one is l- really dedicated to all those parents whose offspring are heading away very shortly. This is a weepy. This is the weepiest poem that I've ever written, actually. When I wrote it, the first time I read it back, I actually cried. Really? Yes. It, I, I wrote it um, as I'd just I'd been visiting Jessica. She now lives in the north of Ireland. And I'd been visiting and I came back and uh, she hadn't been sort of in this new house long. And I thought, oh, I feel like I'm, I'm just, I'm losing her. She's, she's growing up, she's grown, she's gone. And I wrote this poem and uh, it, it did, it did used to make me cry, but I'll be fine today. And uh, it actually mentions her uh, naughty Teddy. He's, he's an absolute legend in his own bedtime. <laughs> Everybody knows not to tell you. He did go to the wedding um, and uh, he is actually mentioned in the poem. Uh, so a oh, real insight okay. into Carol Ellis's family life. It really is. really sweet. This is a slightly abridged version because yes, I know the, the original has several verses, but what's it called? It's called The Empty Nest and I have actually, uh, I'm all, I'll only do the last few verses because it is quite a long uh, poem, but if people want to read the full length poem, it's in a book called Food for Thought. Wonderful. Carol, take it away when you're ready. There we go. At the end of the day, all tucked up into bed. Freshly washed hair on a warm, sleepy head. That old naughty teddy so worn and so battered. Her constant companion, so loved and so tattered. Her magical childhood was filled with such joy. She was daring and bold, could outclimb any boy. Artistic and sporty and smart and so funny. The pleasure she brought, you could not buy with money. You remember you dreamt of her as you were waking, but there in the real world, your heart was just breaking. No head on the pillow, no dolls on the floor. You walk past her bedroom and pause at the door. The house is so quiet, there's no tots and mums, no pram in the hallway, no more biscuit crumbs. What you wouldn't give for a swing on the grass To see small fingerprints formed all over the glass So cherish each moment, each joy and each worry Enjoy every milestone, there's no need to hurry Make sure that you treasure each moment they're young There's no job more important than being a mum Nation Station, Max Radio
live once again from the cook shack with our Georgie Revel. Today, I'm going to be teaching her how to make a pumpkin pie. <laughs> there is one that I've made uh, already, which is here, which you'll be able to see if you go to the Manx Radio Facebook page. Um, some wonderful pictures of the food that hasn't been eaten already by Christy. Uh, Georgie, thank you very much for having us back again. Oh, um, hi, Beth. Hi, Christy. We mentioned in the introduction awards um there's a little one maybe sitting over there with your name on it uh, there is a little one but you know what this amazing guy here that i've managed what a coup to get to the cook shack today is is more important tyler one chef of the year in the isle of man and um what a lovely guy he is too so um i'm delighted to have him here yes i'm really fortunate um um, I was awarded um, the Special Recognition Award from DEFA for promoting local produce and uh, producers. And my goodness, don't we have the most amazing producers on the island and produce and really high end. And as I said in one of my posts, uh, we had a lovely talk from Fiona Fitz Consultancy. Um, and she said, you know, per capita, we are absolutely way above everyone else. And we've got more uh, great taste awards than per capita than anywhere else. So, yeah, we're doing all right in the Isle of Man. We certainly are. Congratulations, Georgie. But you did mention Tyler. And I should say congratulations, Tyler, not only for winning <laughs> Chef of the Year, but also for surviving my driving from Ramsey. Yeah, um, it was quite a track, that wasn't all right, it? Yeah, all right, Tyler, you weren't supposed <laughs> to agree. Um, Tyler, it has been a heck of a weekend for you have you come down off clown die yet uh yeah the support's still been fantastic and uh yeah it's just overwhelming to see the amount of support even in ramsey it's like the oh well done for winning it's good for the bistro because the bistro is a well recognized place as it is so so tell us a bit about where you work um i work at jean pierre's bistro up in ramsey uh it's down parliament street and it's sort of french food but it's modernized a bit now because change of sh uh, chefs over the time including myself so it's good to really put the ball out and just try new interesting ideas with the clientele that we have and now i have to ask because this, this is quite the accolade winning chef of the year do you mind me asking how old you are tyler i'm 25 years old i mean that is an incredible achievement quite extraordinary to be fair and what's brilliant is that you went to UCM, University mm, College yeah, Alaman. Uh, you worked with Chris Franklin, who I know you've got, you hold in such high regard. Mm. Um, and it's great to think that these sort of things can be taught and achieved over here. It's just all down to the mentors that like you've come in and your time, really, and it's just yeah, great. So were you cooking from a, a little lad then? Is it something you uh, did growing so up? I was about 60, and I, I started kitchen portrait and then just delving in ideas with food and just dabbling with, like, home-cooked stuff and then just tweaking my own little recipes and then just really stepping up and getting into the kitchen equally. Fantastic. Well, it's great that you could be here this afternoon. I love the fact that Georgie put you straight to work. <laughs> uh, I mentioned we are going to be making a pumpkin pie. Um, this is quite, looks quite involved, this, Georgie. Here is the finished article. Do you know what, Beth? Um, um, this is something that you would really um, enjoy making. So we've made um, a lovely sweet short crust pastry and we're going to blind bake it and we know you know what blind baking is but just in i'll just help you out just in okay. case you don't so blind baking is when you have like ceramic baking beans or we've got just put here some pulses that we just put back in the jar every time and we're just going to put it on some um some parchment paper put it inside the pastry it holds it creates a weight on the pastry and it just gives it that extra cook cooking bit before you put the filling in so hopefully the filling will absorb into that lovely pastry i think tyler's done a brilliant job of um filling up the pie um, tin and then we're going to mix loads of lovely pumpkin pie puree um which you can get the pumpkin puree um from robinson's and we're gonna add, put some lovely uh isle of man cream Ridge double cream in it a load of spices and a special, uh, a special little, my little quirky bit that lifts, as Tyler said. Um, he's been very polite to me and, and very kind with my cooking because I am not a chef. I love the way you introduced me as a chef, but I am not. I'm a good cook, aren't I, Tony Quirk? And, um, and we've got some lovely alien dairy milk we're going to put in and we're going to have some soft brown sugar. <sighs> Do you know, I have Sounds to ask great. because it's, it, I would just think of this really as an American dish and it's something that, as I said, coming from a uh, half American background, it's something that we used to have as kids. Is this something, Tyler, that you've ever made before, pumpkin pie? 
Uh, not personally, I'm not really a fan of pumpkin, but I'm willing to try new flavours and whatnot. That's got to be a tricky thing to do as a chef because, of course, you have to cook anything for everyone, don't you? And you've got to taste it as you go along. How do you deal with recipes when it's stuff that you don't actually like? Well, I do bite the bullet. Excuse me. <coughs> <laughs> but no, we have like Sunday lunches where we can do different starters, different desserts to really just experiment and have a play about with food and just see what we all enjoy as well to make. So it's good on that side. Station, station, Manx Radio. Level check, Mark Tiley. Well, I'm, I'm as level as a level thing. <laughs> Is that level enough? Does Mark Tiley often get described as level? I don't know. Jo I tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, he's just come back from a dizzying heights gig. I Top know. of Snape fell. Top. My word. Lovely views. You have scaled the heights of stardom. I tell you, played the roof of the world. <laughs> your greatest hit on your Manx Radio. Love so, it. we have another chance to hear another wonderful piece of music recommended by the man himself. Well, thank you. I do enjoy doing this because it makes me dig deep into various bits and pieces. But I didn't have to dig too deep for this. You know, we used to give these little spots a title. Yes, this we is did. Just called a bit Frasier. This is Ridiculous Talent and So Early On. <laughs> if you start writing a song when you're 12 and you sort of finish most of it when you're 13, and then it's all done and dusted when you're 14, and then you record it when you're 16. I know who it is. And then you hang around a bit and meet some friends, and you release it where later on in 1978, so you'd have been sort of 18, 19. And you've got David Gilmore from Pink Floyd helping you uh, get it right. Uh, one of the great conductors and instrumental arrangers, Andrew Powell, who is legendary. And if, my dear listener, you don't know about Andrew Powell, just take an idle moment and look what he's worked on, from symphonies through to Alan Parsons' project through uh, just endless. I mean, he is such uh, an amazing guy. And then you have your debut album and everyone goes bonkers about it. And it just doesn't happen that often mm -hmm. when somebody gets so much talent and all the planets line up you meet these amazing people but you've got the songs and you've got the vision at the age of 12 13 14 and the personality and character yeah. because that's part of it as well i yeah. think with this this artist um i'm just the hugest hugest fan uh, always have been since I first heard the first note of Wuthering Heights, which Capital Radio in London played before anybody else. Nobody was going to play it. I think it was Kenny Everett. Uh, he played it all the hour, every hour, just kept playing it. <laughs> Radio One didn't didn't get on it for ages and ages, but Capital did. But this was her second single, and when you consider the age and all that I've talked about, just marvel at this. Here it is. The Man with the Child in His Eyes, Kate Bush's second single from The Kick Inside. I hear a hymn before I go to sleep and focus on the day that's been. I realise he's there when I turn the light off and turn over. Nobody Indeed, this is for our latest Marjorie challenge, and there's a, a whole Manx Flower Association. And how funny then we should be outside the florists on Parliament Street in Ramsey, because I think 
he's referring to Josephine Kermode, who was known as Kushak, hence floral reference. Exactly. And I'm sure she was born around here at 73 Parliament Street. I can't quite see what the number is on this Shall one. Shall we ask the florist? Shall we? Shall okay. we go in and let's be brave? Let's, let's be brave. brave. Right. Okay. She's right behind me. I can't see anybody here. Hello? Oh, I think someone's coming in from the back. Hi, we're just on a mission to try and find, what number is it? 73 Parliament Street. Is this 73? This is it. Yes. This is number 73 Parliament Street? Is, yes. Ah, would you mind if, if we just had a quick chat with you? Because I don't know if you know, but a very important person was born here. Didn't? Yes. No. <gasps> right. Yeah. Well, what's your name? It's Glynis. Glynis, it's lovely to meet you. And sorry for just descending on you here, <laughs> but we are on a bit of a mission. I'm, I'm Christy and this is Beth. And uh, yeah, we're, we're trying to find a challenge answer, aren't we? Yeah, so basically on a Sunday, we're set a Manx-themed challenge and we have to find the answer to it. And this week's was about a very well-known poet who was born on the 18th of September, 1852. And we found out it's a woman called Josephine Kermode who was born Actually, at 73 no. Parliament Street. Is that not what the plaque's about across the road? Oh, we didn't notice that. <laughs> no, we didn't notice that plaque. Shall we go and have a look? Let's go and have a look. You can join our intrepid explorer team. This is brilliant. We've got a I'm system to say that I haven't looked at this at all. <laughs> well, at least you knew it was there. We walked past it several times and didn't even notice it. So, you know, we appreciate you. Oh, hold on. The plaque, yes. Okay, we better cross right. over. So it's, so it's a bit safer. Not oh, the connection. Philip Moore Callow Kermode, Master of Arts and Manx, Patriot Scholar, antiquary author, founded Isle of Man Natural History. It's not her father. Not. Her father was William Kermode, but there's got to be some connection, hasn't there? Well, this is Kermode House. So, so there you go. So it's all, area. all yeah. this area. So she, Josephine, was one of seven children, um, one of seven who lived beyond childhood. Her father was Reverend William Kermode, um, and Josephine's father was president of the Isle of Man Natural History and Antiquarian Society, and he was to initiate a parish book for Balaf. So she really, knows that all really off the top of her head, you know. It's amazing. Yeah, yeah. I'm conscious much. that we, we, we need to cross back to the shop because yes. we've taken you out of your shop and the doors are just wide open. It's so brilliant, the Isle of Man, this, isn't it? Oh, it's all right. I go for a coffee across there and uh, <laughs> leave the doors open anyway. <laughs> it could only happen over here, that, couldn't it? But how it's amazing so, that yeah. there's that floral link. And it's, it's a florist now. I love that. And she was actually really good friends, apparently, with Sophia Morrison. So as well as writing loads of poetry, one of which we are going to have to recite, incidentally, she was really key in that friendship in helping promote Manx folklore as well. Brilliant. So now you know this is a really important building. Y yes, and my neighbour, Kira, who lives upstairs, she will be really interested because she's into her um, Manx heritage, shall we say. And how long has this place actually been a florist? Um, I've had it for five and a half years, but prior to that, um, I think it had been a florist for probably 20 years or more. Wow. But it has got a bit of a history, this um, building, because... It was a children's clothes shop, so lots of my customers remember being brought here as very small children. Um, it was a Mrs. Twybell that had it and a Mrs. Merrill. And I have heard that prior to that, it has been a gentleman's club. Oh, wow. And, and that's all I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I think at some point it was a bank. My gosh, oh, it really she, has got history. You have looked into it. I oh. love it. Obviously, my wonderful customers come in and tell me things, and they have all a history to tell. So there's some amazing people here with some amazing stories. I don't suppose you happen to do poetry yourself, just on the off chance? I definitely don't. Never been a poet, I'm afraid. <laughs> really glad that now maybe this is something you can look into, yeah, especially if uh, Kira upstairs. Yes. Yes. yes, she'll be really interested, amazing. yes. Yeah. Uh -huh. Well, Glynis, it's been an absolute joy. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak to us. And uh, yes, here we are. It's, it's the birthplace of Cushing and it's a florist. Amazing. I love that. <laughs> I genuinely do really love that. And thank you so, so much to Glynis. Honestly, we did feel very, um, we felt a bit rude. We did feel we? a little bit rude. Just, just literally wandering throwing in. a microphone in her face. I but know. she was great and she really enthusiastic brilliant. about it. And I do love that, that floral yeah. connection. That is yeah. just brilliant. So we've come to the other part of the challenge then, which is to read a poem. And several have been suggested, um, and some of them are obviously dialect poems, which I think would, we would struggle with. We would struggle yeah. with, and I wouldn't want to do that. But we found one called To the Cushig's Friend, which I think is just beautiful. We're just going to read a couple of verses of this. The first and the end. The first verse and the final verse. Okay, so are we ready? Mm -hmm. 
Oh, the Cushig flower in a fairy bower would shine like a star of gold. But when it grows in the farmer's close, tis a shocking weed, we're told. Yet common things may have their wings to help our souls above. And wayside weeds, like kindly deeds, spring from a father's love. Now the Cushag we know may ne- must never grow, where the farmer's work is done. But along the rills, in the heart of the hills, the Cushag may shine like the sun. Where the golden flowers have fairy powers to gladden our hearts with their grace. And in Van and Vegveen and the valleys green, the Cushag still have a place. Isn't that gorgeous? Isn't it beautiful? Really gorgeous. Yeah. So thank you very much, Clarky and Phil. We really enjoyed that one. And we hope did. maybe we've thrown up some more information for them to consider. As yes, well. absolutely. And I think by the sound of things, Glynis is going to go investigating yeah. all the backstories of, of the florist shop mm. as well. Those are all our late lunch leftovers for this week. Do tune in for the main helping on Manx Radio weekdays just after 2pm. Every week, of course, we'll have our regular features with Duxford Diaries. We'll have Mark Tiley's greatest hit, Midweek Mindfulness, and plenty more with our monthly guests as well. But for now, thank you so much for listening to the Late Lunch Leftovers podcast. We'll see you again next time. 